Okay, everybody. Welcome to the speaker series for the Center of Revolutionary Medicine. Uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction, give Mike lots of time. Mike was an undergraduate at Penn State, uh, did some genetics with Henry Hartman. I think Ann Stone was there around the same time. Yeah. Um, came to work with me in New Mexico and ended up uh, having a dissertation committee that was Magdalena Hurtado, who's also on the uh, core faculty here, and me and Billy Kaplan did many years of work on food sharing and hunter-gathers, and then has kind of an interesting story how he transitioned from food sharing into more health-related issues. But I'm not going to tell it. I'm going to let him tell it, because he does a better version. The only thing I wanted to mention is I took 16 students to the field in 1997 for a semester. And Mike and Brian Wood, who was one of our speakers recently in Chesh, were the only two students who actually got a good publication out of one semester of work. So Mike is highly productive. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I introduce you. Either that or I'm not very deep and I can do a study in a short period of time. You're not incompatible. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, thank you, Randy, and everyone else for, for, well, for inviting me here and for uh, uh, meeting with me so far. My interaction's been really positive and looking forward for, for more. And so, let's see if I got... So, despite declines since the 1960s in heart disease and strokes as a major cause of death, it's still the case that cardiovascular disease is the number one source of death in the U.S., up to a third of deaths. Um, and of course, not just in terms of deaths, but in terms of overall uh, cost to uh, a biomedical industry that is trying to treat cardiovascular disease and stroke. It's more than $300 billion a year. And this is not just the uh, number one killer anymore in the first world, but also throughout the world. Uh, three out of ten deaths, basically, so over 17 million, uh, 17 million people uh, back in, in 2012, uh, were basically dying of heart disease or stroke. And so when we think about, you know, for this audience, probably everyone has read this uh, kind of classic paper from 1988 uh, that some aspect of our modern lifestyle might be incongruous with uh, our ancestral genetic legacy such that whether it's our, what we eat, uh, the extent of our physical activity, um, other aspects of you know, our personal habits, drinking, smoking, that somehow there's a mismatch between what we do now and what we would have done in the past. And certainly uh, when this paper was written, uh, this is a quote from it, that, <coughs> that hunter-gatherers, using existing data, uh, much of it was collected <coughs> in the 50s and the 70s, throughout the 50s and 70s, um, in kind of uh, some quick biomedical surveys that certain risk factors were fairly uh, indicative of low risk. That cholesterol uh, was fairly low. Uh, that uh, by measuring blood glu glucose that the prevalence of type 2 diabetes was also fairly low. And so the, the quote that, you know, that there's little or no coronary heart disease in hunter-gatherers. And of course, two big questions that come up well, maybe hunter-gatherers don't live long enough to experience these kinds of late-life uh, types of diseases. And another thing might be, well, maybe the case fatality rate is really high. So if you have heart disease, chances are maybe you don't live very long with it. And so if there's a quick med medical survey, uh, you might be unlikely to see people that are living for a long period of time with these kinds of ailments. And so most kind of starting points of evolutionary perspectives on aging take into account the fact that the force, uh, the strength of selection is declining with age. You know, insights from back, way back to Medawar, uh, Haldane, and of course formalized by Bill Hamilton, that the force of selection will be non-increasing with age as fertility is declining. And so that you get, you know, this period uh, at, towards the end of reproduction, the selection shadow. And anything that is either has a neutral effect or especially if it has a positive effect early in life might be somewhat uh, neutral to the, the effects that might be deleterious at later ages. 
And certainly when we look at the incidence of, uh, this is most recent data from the US, the incidence of fatal heart attacks, uh, coronary heart disease as a function of age, you can see that it really creeps up you know, during this period of the, of the selection shadow, which certainly begs the question then what might be going on earlier in life that might lead to something like this later in life. Um, all right, but of course the first issue though is, well, if this is later in life, do hunter-gatherers even live long enough to where we would see that occurring in say places like in the US? And so uh, a composite kind of survey of all the existing demographic data that's fairly high quality, uh, some of which done by people sitting in this room. Um, and we can, each line is a different uh, subcategory, whether it's green hunter-gatherers, uh, hunter-gatherers with some level of acculturation, or even slash and burn uh, foraging horticulturalists. And then just for <coughs> comparison, some of the earliest available European mortality so Sweden in the mid-18th century, they all basically <coughs> show that if you survive beyond childhood, chances are you will live to your seventh uh, to 70 years or so. So into well into your, your eighth decade of life. Uh, now it's a little bit different than say in the US where that's extended uh, about a decade or 15 years more uh, and a much more marked peak because a lot of the pre-senescent sources of mortality have been eliminated. But the general point that hunter-gatherers could, can uh, live uh, well past the period of, say, age 35, 40, well into the selection shadow. And that when you actually compare, say, a composite mortality curve for hunter-gatherers with that of, say, uh, the United States, uh, if we just take the ratio of that, you can see that the, the, the major difference in mortality between hunter-gatherers and ourselves <coughs> is early in life. Uh, and that by the time you get to say age 15, that difference is 14 fold higher in hunter gatherers. By age 40, it's seven times higher. And by age 60, it's only three times higher. So if anything, a uh, pattern of potential convergence, uh, but that most of the difference where, and where you would expect uh, selection to really have a big impact for trying to reduce uh, this potential sources of mortality early in life. All right. So, <coughs> With that kind of intro, the, the where I want to take this talk, uh, one, what insights can be gained from the study of more traditional societies about this particular topic of cardiovascular disease? And we want to ask, is low atherosclerosis risk only due to the absence of standard risk factors? So if all I do is present a population that doesn't have what we know or suspect causes heart disease, then, you know, that's an interesting study, but it, we haven't necessarily learned anything particularly new. And so hopefully I'll argue that that's not the case here and that certain aspects of environment that have not been looked at, particularly pathogen exposure, uh, might affect the likelihood of atherosclerosis. All right, and so this is a recent study uh, a couple years ago in The Lancet that took a somewhat different perspective than the one I, I presented before about changes in lifestyle. I'll just read this part to you. Uh, this was a study based on 137 mummies uh, in four different world regions, so ancient uh, Peru, ancient Egypt, um, the Aleutian Islands, and the American Southwest, covering about 4,000 years of history, and they looked at five different arterial beds and found evidence of probable or definite uh, atherosclerosis <coughs> based on calcification, such as you can see here, the calcified aortic arch in the cor coronary artery, and then here in the carotid artery, this is from a 30-year-old, uh, no, sorry, 40, late 40, early 50, late 20, early 30, Unangan woman of the Aleutian Islands uh, in the uh, 19, early 19th century. So what they found, we found that heart disease is a serial killer that has been stalking mankind for thousands of years, uh, yet the common assumption is that rises in the levels of atherosclerosis is due to lifestyle, uh, and that if modern humans could emulate pre-industrial or even pre-agricultural lifestyles, that atherosclerosis could be avoided. Our findings cast doubt on that assumption, and we think instead that our understanding of the causes of atherosclerosis is incomplete, and that it might be somehow inherent to the process of human aging. So it's a sort of a different view that atherosclerosis has always been with us, and it's not just a modern scourge based on changes in lifestyle. And we're gonna see these folks again uh, in, later on in this talk. So that brings me to a more kind of micro study, uh, case specific case study um, uh, within 
Amazonian Bolivia, where I've been working uh, jointly with, with Lily Kaplan, uh, who's at New Mexico. Uh, uh, I first went down there in 1999, and we kind of launched this project uh, in the early 2000s, the Chimane Health and Life History Project. Uh, and so the Chimane are kind of like a, uh, if you're familiar with Amazonian slash and burn <coughs> horticultural populations, uh, they're the neo living within the neotropics of kind of uh, central uh, Bolivia. And um, I just want to get, sometimes we often don't just step back and say, why should we care about this particular population? Uh, and so I just want to justify why we choose the Chimane as a study population, and particularly with what I'm talking about today. So first of all, certain aspects of their ecology, uh, while certainly Chimani are not hunter-gatherers, uh, but they share certain characteristics uh, with uh, pre-industrial humans, such as relatively high burden of pathogens. They're energy limited, so there's no supermarkets or effective uh, <coughs> storage techniques. Uh, they're a natural fertility population. Uh, in fact, fertility is very high. The average woman has nine births over her lifetime. Uh, and very minimal access to health care. Their subsistence uh, is based, you know, the majority of the calories comes from <coughs> small-scale slash and burn horticulture, although more of their time is actually spent engaged in hunting and fishing activities. Uh, and more importantly here, they have a relatively large population. So if I were working, say, with the Hadza, uh, or more hunter-gatherer population, uh, there's about maybe 500 Hadza that are actively hunting and gathering. And so if maybe 3% are over the age of, say, 60 my N on older adults is going to be relatively small, whereas here we can have a much larger uh, N if we're interested in things that are affecting older adults. And also there's this kind of quasi-experimental condition that because there's so many Chimane living in different areas uh, that vary in access to roads and markets, that we can actually kind of use that natural variation to explore uh, <coughs> to what extent do different changes in lifestyle characteristics affect different aspects of health and disease. So as I mentioned, they're slash and burn horticulturalists. So plantains are a major component of the diet. Sweet manioc is consumed mostly in the form of, of fermented beer. Uh, and of course, uh, also since the Jesuits uh, came in, uh, rice and corn is available and, and things like uh, uh, um, papaya. Uh, but rich source of protein and fats are coming from the classic neotropical animals. So collard peccary. Uh, tapir, coatimundis, a variety of species of monkeys, collared anteater, uh, and of course uh, a variety of freshwater fish obtained through a variety of different techniques. And so over the past, for over a decade basically I've had different kind of ways of doing research, but one that I'll use, be talking about here is just a surveillance biomedical anthropological research going from one village to the next uh, over you know, maybe once a year. Uh, or so, so that we have good, not just cross-sectional, but longitudinal information, clinical histories of people, as well as the advantage of a field-based laboratory. Um, uh, let's say it's BSL-3, uh, the laboratory, uh, <laughs> um, to be able to, which is the basis of some of the results I'm going to show you today. So Going back to then atherosclerosis, uh, by the time we're even 20 years old, 15% of us basically will have signs of early coronary atherosclerosis. By the time we're 60, we'll, most of us will have fully developed atherosclerosis. <coughs> and again, as I mentioned, you know, this, w this view, uh, maybe it's so common amongst us uh, because perhaps it's a normal part of aging in all parts of the modern world. So our starting point with this particular population is let's just look at the evidence of traditional risk factors first to see whether we suspect that we might have uh, heart disease. And so first of all, the Chimani have fairly minimal levels of obesity. So for a lot of these analyses, I'm going to just compare, because we're self-centered, we'll compare uh, Bolivians with, with Americans. Uh, fairly low levels of obesity. Now, if we looked at overweight. Overweight is actually not minimal. Probably about 25% of Chimani adults uh, can be characterized as overweight. Uh, now despite the low levels of obesity, it is the case though that women are actually more <coughs> six times more likely to be obese than men. Uh, and that some indicators of acculturation like speaking fluent Spanish or having more education uh, is associated with uh, increased likelihood of being obese. Uh, cholesterol uh, if you like the distributions, you can see here, um, 
uh, above the standard cutoffs of 200 for total cholesterol at the top, and then LDL or the bad cholesterol on the bottom above 100, that basically Americans, while a third of Americans are categorized into the clinically high categories, that that's you know, two to three percent basically in the Chimane, so fairly low levels of cholesterol, uh, both total and uh, LDL. Cigarette smoking uh, is also fairly uncommon, you know, using a, a measure of cumulative exposure, uh, cigarette pack years. Again, these are the Chimani on the bottom, men and women, and Americans on, uh, on the top. So fairly low levels of cumulative exposure. Uh, hypertension is fairly minimal. Uh, the red curve here uh, is basically the, the prevalence of hypertension as a function of age. And even though it's lower than in all these other populations where it's comp comparable data, uh, when we actually use more of a gold standard approach where you have to have multiple <laughs> measures of high blood pressure to be categorized as hypertensive, that prevalence is about halved. So there is evidence of white lab coat effect. Uh, and the age-related increase in blood pressure is fairly minimal. And so just comparing 50 other populations <laughs> from the intersalt study and then the, with the Chimane, the solid dot here, uh, basically the slope, so the increase of systolic and diastolic blood pressure per 10 years <laughs> as an adult, uh, you can see that the Chimane are well below the kind of average here for uh, across these populations. And here's the, like the baseline uh, blood pressure at age 20 uh, and then the increase per decade. And in fact, these other circles here that are within the red circle are the Yanomamo and Kikuyu, so other kind of non, uh, kind of national, you know, pre-industrial kinds of populations. All right, if we look at uh, glycated hemoglobin as an indicator of more kind of chronic uh, glucose regulation, uh, with above 6.5% is indicative of diabetes risk. Uh, very few, only 1% basically of adults between 40 and 80 uh, above that cutoff and the comparable number for the U.S. based on NHANES data is about 15%. Um, that being said, there are, you know, Chimani adults that are in the pre-diabetic category here. And this is important because just from North uh, American Amer uh, Amerindians, we know they have very high risk of diabetes, that this population is not at that level, even though they might be, say, genetically susceptible. Uh, now, in terms of physical activity, it is the case that the Chimani are active, but they're not what well, I categorize or has been categorized as vigorously active. And so based on uh, throwing accelerometers and heart rate monitors on people, and we've also now have a sample based on filthy labeled water, uh, if you, the PAL, the physical activity level, which is really just a multiplier of the basal metabolic rate, uh, the green square here is the Chimani, and for women, you can see they're right in the middle of other studies that have been done in more developed and less developed uh, populations. This is based on the Human Development Index. So right in the middle, whereas men are a bit on the high end. And so, and when you look more closely at the data, what it really seems to be the case, it's not that the Chimani are super active, it's just that they're not very sedentary. Uh, and as you might expect, based on not being very sedentary, different measures of their cardiorespiratory <coughs> fitness, such as VO2 max, is quite high. There's comparable data using the same method with Canadians. Uh, and the purple here are the Chimani. And for women and men, they show evidence of having fairly athletic hearts, uh, strong VO2 max, uh, comparable to athletes, uh, or at least endurance trained uh, athletes or active uh, Americans. Or that's what the dash lines are. Uh, now, but on the flip side, Chimani do have some risk factors. So HDL, which has often been used, you know, your measure of good cholesterol that helps scavenge LDL, but also has a kind of a, plays an important maintenance crew cleanup role uh, along the endothelial layers of your arteries. Uh, and so it's been argued that uh, having high levels of HDL is important. Uh, 40 is often, having above 40 is kind of the standard clip. Uh, cut off for, for what you would want, and more than half of Chimani are actually below that level. Uh, you can see the average is 37 uh, compared to, say, your average American, where the average is much higher. So Chimani are high risk in terms of HDL. And then where I want to take you is that Chimani also live in a fairly infectious environment. Uh, at any given time, during one of our clinical visits, two out of three 
two to three out of 10 uh, might have some respiratory infection. 15 to 30% might have some gastrointestinal infection. Uh, this is probably an underestimate, but uh, folks have skin infections. And seven out of 10 will have at least one type of intestinal worm. The most popular candidates here are hookworm, uh, two species of roundworm, uh, and also whipworm. And because of this, when we actually look at the component of your white blood cells, your eosinophils, that are most implicated in combating uh, multicellular and macroparasites, uh, the Chimani have really high levels of eosinophils. So uh, the standard cutoffs you should have below 5%, and you can see the US and Haines, 3%, uh, all the way skewed to the left, whereas the Chimani, the average is 20%. You can see lots of people have really high levels of eosinophils. And we're gonna come back to this, because I think this is really important here, the effects of this high levels of eosinophils on immune function and what implications that might have with respect to heart disease. But other sources of infectious disease are also prevalent, uh, just based on a small sample so far, uh, looking at seropositivity uh, amongst people who are not immunized. These are older adults. So lots of people have Hep A, some folks with Hep B exposure, dengue, yellow fever, leptospirosis. Uh, the Chagas might not be true because there's cross-reactivity with leishmaniasis, which we do know exists in the area. Uh, toxoplasmosis, rubiola, measles exposure. Uh, and also uh, Helibac uh, Helicobacter pylori. Yes? So this is tropical, what about malaria? Uh, actually, interestingly, there's no malaria in the area. Uh, it's in the foothills of the Andes, and so it's not high elevation. It's like maybe 100 to a couple hundred meters uh, above ground, but there just hasn't been any reported kind of malaria in the area. Lots of other febrile illnesses, but no uh, malaria. I've never taken any malaria prophylactic, nor has anyone on my team, uh, and we've been okay. Um, so now under these high infection conditions, you might expect that a strong immune response, and particularly a strong acute phase, uh, innate immune response, uh, basically inflammation, might be adaptive. And what's kind of unclear though is that well, it makes sense if you have acute infection, you want a short burst of a response, but then you want that response to kind of revert back to normal after you've cleared the infection. And certainly in modern Americans and modern populations, uh, we see much more evidence of this chronic low-grade inflammation. Uh, and people haven't really talked so much about the source of inflammation as much as just if you have high levels or, uh, that are consistent or cumulative exposure to inflammation. And I think the distinction is important because if your source of, infer of inflammation is cigarette smoking, in particular obesity, uh, so some folks have even called it metaflammation, uh, uh, that is leading to kind of chronic low-grade inflammation. We know that uh, adipocytes, uh, the adipose tissue is not metabolically inert and that it is actively uh, associated with uh, chronic low-grade inflammation. Uh, and other folks have made these, coined these terms, inflammaging, because Inflammation gets worse with age. You see an uh, increase in a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines with age, uh, and particularly amongst individuals who are more obese. And so you get all these consequences for late life based on selection for strong kind of anti-infection uh, inflammatory responses. Now, certainly one possibility here is that, well, our immune systems might not be regulated in the same kind of way given you know, modern hygienic uh, conditions. Uh, and you can pick your favorite you know, parasite, whether it's helminths, or a particular microbiota, or some combination of these that might regulate immune function in ways that, as I'll say, or argue, uh, basically either alters the effects of inflammation or maybe helps contain inflammation such that its effects are not as destructive uh, in populations like the Chimane as they might be amongst ourselves. So, and inflammation we know is involved in all stages of atherosclerosis from just even the buildup uh, of, the, of foam cells in earlier stages when basically you have no clinical symptoms to the development of the lesions and atheromas to the you know, development of the fibrous cap that the immune system is involved and that inflammation is involved uh, that monocytes are recruited and differentiated into macrophages that are basically leading to the, the, the accumulation of the gunk that basically can, can, can clog your artery, but then ultimately 
to the point where you can have a disruption or erosion of the plot of the plaque that can lead to uh, a severe event. Um, and this is probably why, uh, and this Paul Richards is a big advocate of this, that uh, you know, one of the reasons that statins work so effectively is not just because it's reducing your LDL. These are people who went on statins, and the, and the, problem, the cumulative rate of recurrent uh, myocardial infarcts uh, or death from coronary causes. And so, yeah, if you have high cholesterol after the statins, you're more likely to, have it, uh, to die or to have an a infarct versus you have low, but it was also the case that after the statin use, the people who had higher levels of C-reactive protein, which is a common biomarker of inflammation, that's been linked to uh, coronary events, uh, that it has an effect. And if you combine the two, basically, after statins, if you can reduce your LDL and your CRP, you have the lowest likelihood of having a recurrent event uh, based on if you have high levels of both, you're the highest risk, and it's sort of indistingu indistinguishable uh, differences if you intermediate levels of the LDL or the CRP. All right, so among Chimai, no matter what measure of inflammation you use, that inflammation is high. So whether it's C-reactive protein, uh, which is more specific, acute phase response, whereas your, just your sedimentation rate is not very specific, but again, is another indicator of inflammation. Uh, high levels of immune activation, just from leukocyte counts or lymphocyte counts, but at the same time, very low levels of monocytes. Whether in terms of percent of white blood cells or absolute number, Chimani have way lower monocytes than, than we have, uh, probably because they're being uh, differentiated to be used for other, uh, for fighting infections. Um, and they have high levels of a variety of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and some of those cytokines we've seen evidence that they increase with age. Uh, just to kind of show you, again, using comparable lab methods, CRP tends to increase with age. Uh, this is uh, with Chimane compared to, say, the U.S. and other populations. So fairly high levels, but sort of comparable with Americans. But again, what I want to argue is that this, for Americans, is coming from more from obesity and, CR, uh, and smoking, whereas from here, for uh, Chimane, is coming more from infection. And if we look at the same people over time, because uh, one could say, well, maybe the levels are so high, but it's just a one shot. Uh, and that any other time you sample them, they might have low levels of CRP. What well, actually turns out, if you look at people who've been sampled multiple times, uh, almost half of those times, basically uh, half of those people were elevated levels of C-reactive protein both times that they were sampled. Uh, and so far, the literature is sort of indistinguishable between, it's about exposure. So whether it's, you know, repeat acute versus chronic uh, low, uh, your total exposure can still be quite high. But I think the implications are very different uh, that haven't really been explored before uh, because typically uh, people aren't focusing on kinds of populations that have these types of infections. So to summarize, on the low risk side, Chimani have low levels of obesity, High, fairly high activity. I didn't really talk about the diet, but you know they're not eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, minimal smoking, low levels of blood lipids, fairly minimal diabetes, but on the high risk, low levels of HDL and high levels of inflammation. So we tried to go a little bit subclinical. So looking at peripheral <coughs> arterial disease using the ankle brachial index, so the extent to which if you have differential blood pressure in your ankle uh, and, your, and your arms, going below the ratio of 0.9 is indicative of peripheral arterial disease. Uh, and this is a number really easy to calculate, prevalence of zero uh, uh, across all ages. And so not only is it non-zero everywhere else it's been looked at, but it's increasing with age everywhere else as well. So because, you know, this wasn't, you know, we need to spend more money to figure out things that the Chimani don't have. Uh, so we can go one, you know, try to go a, a step further, you know, William Osler, the, the father of modern medicine, you know, you're as old as your arteries, and maybe as a tribute to that, you can actually get your arterial age if you go get your, uh, something like this, using a portable ultrasound machine, you can scan the carotid artery uh, so that we can basically look at the thickness of the inner two layers, the intima and the media layers of the uh, uh, of the artery, 
And you can see here's someone with atherosclerosis, it's much thicker, <laughs> versus someone uh, with healthy arteries. And that these measures have been used and been widely predictive of coronary events. Now, so more recently, uh, and this is over the past two years, uh, this is the actual Horace group. So the people that wrote the Lancet paper that scanned the mummies uh, and are, are now uh, took advantage of the French government generously donating a CT scanner in the middle of Bolivia, uh, the 250 kilometers away. So actually, as we speak, I have a campaign going right now where we're shuttling uh, Chimane out of the village to go to the town about 10 hours away uh, so that they can be scanned by the CT scanner. Um, so people like Sam Juan, uh, Randy Thompson, Bruno Froelich, James Min, uh, and Gregory Thomas, who are kind of uh, cardiologists and radiologists behind that effort. And I thought it would be informative, this is what we ate at our recent meeting <laughs> a couple months ago, which maybe the positive, you know, maybe they don't think diet is as important as uh, maybe other people. Uh, or maybe just in good company, if you're going to have an infarct, you know, uh, then you can eat uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. So uh, basically, to, with the CT scanner, you can basically assess different measures uh, of vascular calcification. And so, well, we had 200, we had 80 more now, but uh, what's analyzed is about 288 adults over the age of 50 uh, through the 16 slice scanner. And the measure I'm gonna focus on today is coronary artery calcium score. Uh, it's a sensitive and specific marker for coronary arterial disease. Uh, and you can detect it as early as you know, the second, day, second decade after, as soon as you have some fatty streak formation in the arteries. And there's a lot of evidence showing good predictive uh, pers and prospective studies between coronary, uh, the score, and the degree of atherosclerosis in coronary events. So just as one quick graph of that, whether you're low, intermediate, or high risk on your Framingham risk score, higher levels of the CAC were associated with higher uh, predicted mortality. Uh, but but mortality due to um, basically a heart attack or a stroke. So it's not just an isolate, probably. It's very light. Un well, we don't really have comparable data yet to this extent in other populations. Now, in Ghana, we were collaborating with a group. Um, uh, so in people over the age of 50, uh, very little evidence, despite, again, similar pro-inflammatory profiles. The infarct based on the EKG was about 1%. Uh, and actually, it's very possible because I think they just based on what the machine gives you automatically and it usually overestimates. Uh, peripheral arterial disease, again, they used the same uh, method we did and they got about less than 3%, so not zero, but still very low levels. Uh, but in this particular population, hypertension was actually a lot higher, as was obesity, but again, similar findings. So that takes us then to the more kind of speculative, you know, uh, hypotheses that haven't been as adequately uh, considered as traditional risk factors, the role of infection. And infection can have some pro-atherogenic kinds of uh, effects, such as, as I mentioned, by increasing inflammation, both local inflammation uh, in the arteries, but also perhaps systemic inflammation that also might have localized effects, but also that infection might be anti-atherogenic. And this can happen through a variety of different ways. I won't go into all of them. One, it could lower metabolic risk factors. So uh, certainly both through the way that uh, different parasites might alter uh, lipid metabolism uh, or the, the host response to the presence of certain parasites, that LDL could be altered, cholesterol, triglyceride, glucose um, that different parasites might consume. Uh, another possibility is that if your immune system, I mean, I guess the, in layman's term, right, that your immune system is busy doing what it's supposed to do, right, and it's, you know, not, it's ignoring uh, these sites of injuries in the arteries, and so that uh, the immune system is not responding to, to uh, the artery um, and helping to build up these lesions. And part of the way that that might, this might these are not independent uh, uh, hypotheses, uh, but that because immune function might be modulated or regulated differently, uh, whether it's just shifted in a more Th2 direction, such that you get not just high levels of pro-inflammatory, but uh, combined with high levels of anti-inflammatory activity that might contain the inflammation's effects, uh, or that through you know, higher levels of Tregs, again, that you might have a better re regulated immune system 
such that inflammation doesn't operate in the same way in the presence of especially kind of helminthic type parasites. And so it's actually been known for some time that uh, during certain seasons where respiratory infections are common uh, or when someone gets a respiratory infection in the hospital that there's a higher likelihood of having an infarct uh, uh, subsequently. Uh, and so that certainly the, the, the role of the immune system in, in plaques, you've got macrophages, T cells, B cells, neutrophils that are infiltrating the blood vessels and the thrombus itself. And that especially at the site of the plaque rupture because white blood cells can help degrade the collagen that leads to the, the thinning of the fibrous cap and then stream to plaque erosion or plaque rupture. Uh, and there's been a couple studies that have showed if you look at, this is just, cyto, if you look at whether people have had, had exposure to cytomegalovirus, chlamydia pneumonia, hep A, herpes simplex uh, one or two, if you just count up how many seropositivities to those things, uh, basically, the study in Chinese adults showed that greater pathogen exposure was associated with higher prevalence of coronary arterial disease, and that they showed that the effect was mediated basically through higher levels of C-reactive protein. So again, consistent with that first idea that some infections might lead to higher risk, not lower risk. But at the same time, in other types of parasites, so this is actually one kind of more recent example that was a great Murray model. So within mice, they so we, you know, gave a, a helminth that increased uh, the levels of eosinophils. So I said we'd return back to eosinophils, and that the eosinophils were helping to basically uh, leading to the cascade of an increase in, I guess, the, 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 the M2 type macrophages. These are the macrophages that are going to have anti-inflammatory effects uh, as opposed to higher levels of the the macrophages that have pro-inflammatory effects. Uh, and so, you know, shifting immune function again towards a more Th2 direction with higher levels of uh, regulation that basically lead to the end result that if you, and this is all in adipocytes, so all within uh, fat tissue, and that when you feed these mice uh, ad libitum, uh, their downstream consequences is not uh, basically resulting in glucose uh, or insulin intolerance uh, or any symptoms that look like type 2 diabetes or heart disease, whereas in the absence of the parasite, when you feed, uh, when you feed uh, the mice ad libitum, uh, you see the other type of macrophages, the pro-inflammatory increasing, uh, poorly regulated immune function, and basically in glucose intolerance. Uh, and the consequences that end up looking like basically metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, uh, even in mice. And remember, you know, eosinophils are about 3% in the U.S., about 20% in Chimane. Uh, and so far, so this is getting more preliminary, but we found that eosinophils vary inversely with a variety of CBD risk factors. So Chimane with higher levels of eosinophils have lower BMI, lower total cholesterol, lower LDL, lower HDL as well though, lower triglycerides and lower blood glucose. And those are in models that control for a whole host of potential confounders. Uh, and again, the meaning and why, the reason why parasites might have those effects, um, uh, particularly helminths, can be through both what the parasites themselves, you know, directly or indirectly manipulating, using cholesterol, you know, for pathogenesis, uh, as well as the host responses to the presence of, of parasites. But if you take from these models and you take from the Chimane eosinophil level and you say what would happen if the Chimane had American eosinophil levels, then basically you increase BMI by about 0.35, you increase total cholesterol by about 7 points, LDL, you see 5 points, HDL2, triglycerides 8, blood glucose by 4.4. So non-trivial uh, increase uh, just based on this statistical model. And the only example that kind of explores this so far in humans that I found, uh, it was a recent study in Chinese adults, uh, I highlighted the kind of summary, basically that each one standard deviation of increment of eosinophil percentage was associated with a 37% decrease of insulin resistance, again consistent with what was done experimentally in the mice. And so the next direction here, well, one, we're trying to increase our sample size to 1,000 on older adults that we have uh, the CT scanning, but as well as you know, the ultrasound-based measures 
uh, where we can score the plaques as well as the infinite media thickness and a whole host of other variables, uh, including uh, kind of infectious load. I haven't said anything about genetics yet because they're all basically sitting waiting to be uh, to be analyzed using a, a relatively new type of chip. Um, but then a lot of what I just showed you in the past slide was really somewhat uh, uh, cross-sectional. Um, and we have longitudinal data so we can look at the difference from year to year. But a lot can happen within a year. And so you know, the next study we're going to do uh, later this year is to just basically deliver anti-helminths. And certainly you're not going to see a major difference in the arteries after getting rid of the helminth. But you can see a difference in some of the more upstream variables, such as shifts in immune function and changes in immune regulation, as well as the blood lipids and the glucose. Uh, and then finally, you know, the, 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 where I'd like to go with all of this is you know, comparable samples, working with you know, similar field rats that have existing pop, uh, relationships with populations that vary in some of the key ways. You know? Uh, not just the diet and physical activity, but in terms of the types and intensity of, uh, of infection to, to do kind of export uh, a body of methods in a variety of populations. All right, so to summarize and conclude, transitional populations of, say, hunter-gatherers and foraging horticultural populations, I think, are an important lens for understanding the impacts of lifestyle and environment. Uh, and that uh, rather than throw up our hands and say, oh, but these groups aren't pure, right? They're all being going through different stages of acculturation. I actually think that's a strength because it gives us the, the variation we need to, to try to establish some causality. Uh, and among Chimane, infections are the most important cause of death, particularly respiratory infections uh, and morbidity. And perhaps as a response to that, we see high levels of inflammation, but that not all inflammation is equal that although inflammation is high, uh, the types of inflammation from infection in Chimane uh, are associated with high levels of uh, immune regulation, whereas inflammation that you or I might have through obesity or cigarette smoking uh, is not. Um, so despite high inflammation and low HDL, we find little evidence of atherosclerosis, hypertension, infarcts, diabetes. So while an active lifestyle, traditional diet, minimal smoking are protective, uh, regulated immunity in the presence of certain parasites might also protect the heart. So this is what I think is a novel direction, and of course, the pitch, more, more research is needed. Uh, but at the same time, certain features of the aging process might be universal. So uh, the you know, heart muscle is getting, is getting stiffer. We saw diastolic function declining. Uh, arterial uh, thickness is also increasing, so there's some thickening but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have clinically relevant atherosclerosis. So kind of returning to our motivating questions, you know, I do think there's a lot of insights that can be gained from the study of, of these types of societies, because first of all, our typical risk factors don't always work the same way. Uh, that you know, um, when you go to your doctor, if you have high levels of this or low levels of that, it means a certain thing, but it shows that our understanding is under a limited set of environmental uh, circumstances, and that the fact that HDL not only looks very different here, but it's actually higher levels of predictive of, um, of higher levels of CAC uh, is really instructive. In the same way that inflammation, our understanding is incomplete. And so I think there's still a lot to learn and that uh, this kind of approach, I think, can, can help us get there. A nice dialogue with, with, with medicine. And so atheros low atherosclerosis risk uh, is not just due potentially to the standard risk factors, but some new ones as well. And I think what we can say then is that, well, while some aspects of atherosclerosis might be a universal, that because we can't interview or do a medical survey on the mummies, uh, it really seems to be the case that uh, if atherosclerosis may have existed 4,000 years ago, that it probably wasn't going to be clinically relevant. And that's what we can say now about that. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, and I hope I didn't, oh, I, I got some time left, good. Uh, open to questions, uh, comments. Thank you. Um, so, NIH had a big study that came out that said, right, we are biased all of our assumptions about heart disease and stroke because all the studies were done in males, and then there was a lot of work done to try to incorporate females. Do you think that the assumptions about HDL 
and LDL may be biased by European population? I think so. I mean, certainly the age, it might not be so much the European as just maybe non infected, it would be my guess, because certainly uh, LDL and, and the HDL as the traditional risk factors has applied to non European populations as well. Um, uh, I just think that. Um, well, each, our understanding is just somewhat limited about the context. It's, it's an all else equal kind of argument, right? But the all else isn't always equal in different populations. And trying to know uh, to what extent, um, what's the all else that one needs to consider. Uh, I mean, I didn't really talk about the cost of helmets, right? So, um, well, part of what I'm saying here seems to be like, you know, an add on to the hygiene hypothesis. Uh, yeah, I think there's also some evidence potentially that it might, well, we know that it increases your risk of Giardia, but potentially, one thing that kind of came out of the CT scans when we did these uh, is that 100% of the adults had evidence of tuberculosis. Uh, and a third of those cases actually um, seemed to be evidence of active tuberculosis, which is way higher than I ever thought. I, I thought maybe 8% or, you know, or something like that. Um, and Actually, I looked into this, and there's no, there's some speculative work about helmets and their, you know, that they might, because of their uh, impacts on immune function, might increase your risk of uh, tuberculosis. Um, and certainly, the the efficacy of, of certain vaccines, you know, has been established that helmets might uh, impact that as well. So I'm not, uh, now I'm deviating from the question. Sorry, but. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I do think it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of extension of that idea that, you know, we, things might look very different in women. And even here, right, if anything, we're seeing greater risk in women, not the traditional that men always have higher risk on everything. Uh, so, yeah, give me more money. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, thanks for a really awesome talk. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering about uh, the role of sort of blood sugar regulation here, because in modern populations, we get really, you know, dramatic <coughs> spikes in our blood sugar. We can have our blood sugar really high through constantly drinking sugary drinks. And it seems like that's going to put, um, that's creating a different ecology for microbes in our blood and potentially leading to sort of more conflict between our fitness and the fitness of the microbes that are in our blood. And, you know, so is this, you know, plaque development, is this sort of like, you know, indexing ongoing and unresolved conflict between the interests of the microbes that are in the bloodstream and our own immune systems trying to sort of, you know, fight them and could that help resolve some of the paradoxical findings? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting idea. I mean, maybe. Uh, uh, you know, I think, I mean, typically I think what I kind of suspect is that we're here is that, if anything, we're going to see evidence of maybe some type 2 diabetes before we see evidence of diabetes. Certainly, you know, in Western populations, diabetes is a major risk factor for heart disease. Uh, and, I, and I think they're both kind of symptomatic of some underlying etiology. And, uh, yeah, because some of you might have observed, like, wait, you're talking about heart disease, and then you start I kind of shifted to diabetes, but I kind of see it all as like these kind of metabolic -y, uh basically, you know, well, broader sense of metabolic syndrome than the kind of clinical standard usage of that term. Uh, but that, yeah, with poor glucose regulation is indicative of already uh, uh, an immune system that might be working in a particular way that's also going to have effects um, on the arteries. Um, uh, the relevance of other microbes throughout the body and what they're doing in ways that, you know, conduce to their own self-interest that are sucking, or, I mean, I don't know if you're going, like, towards trying to increase spikes in glucose that might serve pathogenic um, just interests. Just you know, if there are um, spikes in glucose or blood glucose is high, that's more of a niche for those microbes to, to bloom, and so it may mm -hmm. be necessary to have a greater immune response or a more, you know, yeah. sort of chronic inflammation to deal with the fact that there's blood, there's, you know, substrate for them to... Yeah, well, it'd be interesting to even test whether, 
your appetite for sugary drinks, you know, in the presence of pathogens, certain pathogens might actually motivate that desire for just massive glucose spike. Uh, I mean, I know just, you know, like, in the market you can get all these, like, really sugary packets, you know, and, and to my tolerance for, I mean, these liquids that are, like, super saturated <laughs> sugary drinks that I would never be able to, you know, tolerate without spitting out, and I'm amazed. Uh, uh, and they, well, some people actually make jokes that it's what the worms want. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, maybe that's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So every time I brush my teeth, I think about all the good and bacteria that I'm getting rid of. And you probably know better than I do, but I think uh, there's certain bacteria in your mouth that can affect uh, heart disease risk later on. And um, I guess, do the Chimani brush their teeth? Is this something that yeah. everyone's looked at? Or? Yeah, I mean, they have, there's a variety of different kind of twigs that they might suck on, and okay. some of them might have some properties mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, could be somewhat antimicrobial. Uh, mm -hmm. We actually have a large sample now of, of, of saliva samples um, to actually look at different bacteria sources, and we've got a lot of dental data mm -hmm. now, and uh, plaques, cork, and things like that. None of it's been analyzed yet, so I can't really say anything other than the, 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 the oral health is really bad, uh, and there's uh, and there's a huge sex difference, right? And I think the what's the what's the phrase one tooth one child? And I think in the Chimani case it's like 1.4 teeth uh, per child, and there's nine, you know, on yeah. average. Yeah. So yeah. you know, it's it's uh, it's a quite severe uh, kind of. So yeah, but if anything, you would think that would be even more, right. you know, these cardiogenic type yeah. uh, like microbes that mm -hmm. certainly in Western populations, CRP is correlated with higher levels of caries and mm -hmm. periodontal infections and heart disease risk. And again, in spite of that, even if that were the case, mm -hmm. uh, we don't see that downstream consequence. Kim? So at the very beginning, um, I remember clear back when I was in graduate school, Mel Connor and Boyd Eaton are telling us that myocardial infarction is not an important cause of death in the ancestors. And, um, and, and it is now, and so therefore they surmise that it has to have something to do with modern conditions. I think their original logic was coming out of um, what we would now call verbal autopsies, which were all the demographic interviews that people like Nancy Howell and me and others were doing. And we weren't finding any deaths or very, very few deaths that could possibly be assigned to um, this category. But the other issue was that there's no obvious evidence that other mammals are dying of myocardial infarctions, including other primates. So um, we may have been wrong about our understanding of what were the causes and mechanisms, but if you go back to the big issue, do you think that we can still agree that it looks like myocardial infarction is not a major cause of death in our ancestors, and it is now? Yeah, so, I mean, it's interesting, because with, with, with autopsies and, and body chimps uh, that, you know, Barky and others have kind of compiled, heart disease is the number one killer of chimpanzees as well, but it's a very different type of heart disease. So these cardiomyopathies that look uh, very different than just the more atherosclerotic type heart disease, and certainly you know it's been known that certain infections you know can can uh, impact hearts, Chagas for example, uh, and you know that that uh, and other infections that can impact the valves. So you know it's well known right rheumatic fever you know uh, can can lead to um, valvular heart disease. And so I do think that those types of heart disease have probably been around, uh, you know, leading to congestive heart failure. But as far as these atherosclerotic that type would, pathways, that what that would look like on the ground if yeah. you were there is it would look like somebody was dying of illness or old age, or right, something. and having trouble breathing, and, and you know, they, you know, like uh, when I walk uphill a little bit, I get winded really you know, yeah. quickly because you, you're just not getting enough oxygen. Because so. in the interviews, the only thing we can detect is things like, did the person just keel over and fall dead? 
Right. And so if you have Chagas in the area, was sitting there and he fell over the fire. Yeah. yeah. Right. And if you had Chagas, you know, oftentimes that's very quite it's quite clear, right? When when that's the case. I mean, uh, I'm hearing stories from colleagues, you know, in Venezuela that like you know, soccer players, you know, exiting the hospital, they just drop dead. And in areas where there's Chagas, you know, those types of anecdotes are all over the place. Uh, and so you're right. I mean, that. Uh, it's, um, I think, well, I think some of the, the reason why Boyd Eaton and those folks in the 80s uh, were arguing for the absence is partly because of the, when they looked at the traditional risk factors, everyone had low levels of those things. Uh, there was probably a little bit of verbal autopsy, but there was even a couple studies, I mean, like with pygmies, where there were actually EKGs. But again, these were fairly quick studies, and, and, and you're right that, we didn't really know that it was really completely absent uh, uh, using kind of better methods. And so what I would say, based on what we're seeing here, that I don't think atherosclerotic type heart disease would have been typical in the past. Do we have time for one more short question? I don't know how the story didn't tell. What was that? I want to hear Kim's story that you didn't tell. About how you shifted from food sharing to. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I, when you said that, I was like, God, oh, that's not even in my talk. <laughs> uh, well, for me, so one of my interests with food sharing, which is how, uh, you know, when you have to rely only on your own efforts, you know, that's fine and good if you can reliably provide for yourself. But as soon as you get sick, as soon as you get injured, as soon as you, you know, you just feel, don't feel like, you know, working that day. You know, where are you going to get food from? And who's going to take care of you? And so the connections with kind of the social dimensions of managing risk of all type, not just the day-to-day -day food variability, but sickness, injuries, uh, even other kinds of things. Like you don't know how many kids you're going to have, right? What if you, you, you err on the side of having too many and you can't always support them, uh, and so you need you know, some support from others. Uh, so the extent of how does social security work? And of course, all the obvious uh, connections with health. And then with the idea that, well, how much of that is relevant to why Chimani, or not Chimani, but uh, ancestral hunter-gatherers may have had uh, any particular length of kind of life that uh, in order to get to survive to later ages, presumably there were many periods where they were being helped and then they're also in turn helping others. And so, you know, the connection the social dimensions, it just became quite clear that you know, zooming out, that sharing and cooperation is essentially you know, is foundational for thinking about uh, long life and social species, and then of course the kinds of consequences for then thinking about, well as soon as you start talking about long life, you naturally start thinking about immune function, right, because you need to be maintaining and repairing and uh, and then when you think about immune function, you need to know about what are the insults that immune functions are, are fighting. And that, those were, that was the kind of path we've taken. A lot of the earlier stuff was kind of how the immune system changes you know, with age and you know, immune senescence, immunosenescence. And that was kind of how then we got into heart disease, uh, was kind of through that very indirect kind of route. Thank well, thank you. Much. Yeah.